Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a head CT in a patient with an intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, that should be quite obvious. Uh, we have hemorrhage in the left cerebral hemisphere and we have it in the ventricle. Which do you suppose took place first? Well, this left hemispheric area of hemorrhage involves portions of the basal ganglia and the caudate nucleus head would be here, putamen is here, and globus pallidus is back in here. So this could be a globus pallidus hemorrhage, and I would suspect that's the case. Caudate, putamen, globus pallidus, roughly speaking. So hypertensive hemorrhages usually occur in the basal ganglia, most commonly, also occasionally in the cerebellum. And it is not uncommon when they are large that they extend into the ventricular system. And that's what has happened here. So you have intraventricular extension and you're defining the left lateral ventricle, which is now to the right of midline. So there's significant midline shift. And you have some blood in the occipital horn of the right lateral ventricle and in the body of the right lateral ventricle. It is relatively sparing the frontal horn of the right lateral ventricle, whereas the left lateral ventricle is pretty much filled anteriorly with just some relative sparing in the trigone or posterior portion of the left lateral ventricle. This is blood in the third ventricle. So the right and left lateral ventricles empty through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle it's actually through the foramina of Monroe because there's one on each side. Foramina of Monroe into the third ventricle and then from the third ventricle which is here it has to go through the cerebral aqueduct to get to the fourth ventricle and the cerebral aqueduct is just slightly deep to the overlying superior and inferior colliculi so I would say it's right in here and it's being squeezed so there's not much getting through there. That is why the lateral ventricles are a little distended. So this blood in the left hemisphere, which was hypertensive, extended into the lateral ventricles, causing an increased pressure in them. And that's also why this middle-aged to older person has no cortical sulci available, because there's such a great deal of mass effect in both cerebral hemispheres. You can see a little bit of cortical sulci back here and maybe over here a little bit. And there's some from there too. Here and here. And here and here. But elsewhere, they're pretty tight. You see very few of them here. Here you see cortical sulci. But you look down at these levels where the hemorrhage is worst and you see no cortical sulci here and pretty much none over the convexity of the right hemisphere as well. This is typical of a hypertensive hemorrhage centered in the basal ganglia, occasionally extending into the ventricular system, not at all uncommon, and into the third ventricle, and then through the cerebral aqueduct, as I was saying a moment ago, into, this is cerebral aqueduct still, here is the midbrain, and here are the cerebral peduncles. So if we go down a little farther th from that, you can see that this cerebral aqueduct, which you can barely make out right there, you can see a little bit better on the next cut here. trying to get that little cut. There we go. So here's the cerebral aqueduct. And then if you go posteriorly and inferior a little bit more, you see the fourth ventricle. Now the fourth ventricle doesn't look too bad because most of the mass effect is supratentorial. Remember the tentorium separates the posterior fossa from the supratentorial structures, which are both hemispheres, both cerebral hemispheres. Here you get a sense that maybe it occurred, the hemorrhage occurred 
in this area, it's right in the basal ganglia. Here's thalamus. Here's some of internal capsule there. So here's, a, here's the abnormal side. And if you look on the normal side, you see this V of low attenuation? That's white matter tracts. And that's the internal capsule, the anterior limb of the internal capsule, the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And right here is the genu, the knee, the genu of the internal capsule. And that separates very nicely for us the caudate nucleus head, the head of the caudate, the putamen, which is a portion of this triangular structure, the more lateral portion specifically, the more medial triangular portion here is the putamen. So here you have caudate, putamen, globus pallidus, anterior limb of the internal capsule, posterior limb of the internal capsule. So what is this? That's the thalamus. Don't see it very well on this side, but this is thalamus. This is caudate nucleus, primarily the head of the caudate nucleus. And this area here is sometimes called the lentiform nucleus because it has kind of a lens configuration, but it is actually two components. The putamen, more laterally positioned in a triangular configuration, something like this, and then a smaller posterior medial component here, globus pallidus. So not much mass effect in the posterior fossa because the tentorium is kind of blocking it. The tentorium, by the way, you can see here and here and at successively lower levels because it is shaped like this and allows the brain stem to go through it. Uh, on successive levels, you see that the leaves, the margins of the tentoria are farther and farther apart. So that's what you're seeing on this one, two, three view. So that on this view here, for example, this is posterior fossa. This is posterior cerebral hemispheres. This is difficult to conceptualize, but I encourage you to get it clear in your mind that an axial cut will have both posterior fossa and supratentorial structures on some of them. So the tentorium itself is right here. You don't really see it because it's a very thin, though tough, sheet. It's composed of dura, and it separates the posterior fossa from the supratentorial portion of the cranial vault. Let's go up a little bit above again here and look and see. It would be important on reporting this to drop a straight line here and measure from the midline, which would be about here to that line, to that straight line. And that would be about 1.2 or 3 centimeters. 1.2 or 3 centimeters midline shift to the right would be part of the report. There's substantial mass effect with effacement of the cortical sulci. The sulci are the folds like here, and effacement means they're squeezed in such a manner that you no longer see the little trace amount of fluid which is in the cortical sulci. As you do back here, because this is exposed to the more direct pressure from the hemorrhage in the left basal ganglia as well as the intraventricular hemorrhage. Very importantly, there is brainstem compression. And I want you to understand this because a lot of people, I won't name names, but a lot of people, some of them possibly even radiologists, don't quite appreciate that what we're seeing here are the same structures we see over here. So you see temporal lobe, middle cerebral artery fossa, that area, and here's the temporal horn of the right lateral ventricle. It's a little prominent, but it has a normal configuration. On this side, you have this hemorrhage here, 
you have a little squeezing of the temporal horn of the left lateral ventricle, which is the one that extends down here. And this is the medial aspect of that temporal horn that we're seeing here. And it's pushed much farther toward the midline than the one on the other side is. So if you drop that line that we like to drop here, like this, then that's about a centimeter away from the midline, whereas this is about two centimeters from the midline. So that shows that this part of the temporal lobe, sometimes called the uncus, U-N-C-U-S, is pushed medially. And what is it compressing? It's compressing the midbrain. So here, even though it's hard to see, with experience you'll be able to see this. This is the cerebral aqueduct. Here are the cerebral peduncles. This is where the pyramidal tracts and other communications between the brain stem and the cerebral hemispheres takes place. So there's a little gap between those where sometimes you can make out a little portion. Here we go. It's more clearly depicted here. Here are the cerebral peduncles, kind of the little things upon which the hemispheres stand, the cerebral peduncles. Pyramidal tracts are in there. And here is the cerebral aqueduct. So if you go down a little farther, you say, oh my goodness, this, these midbrain structures that I see here, you can even tell that they are pushed over this way, squeezed a little bit. But on this level right here, you can really tell, and actually more on this level, you can tell that there's more midline shift and that the cisterns, the perimesencephalic around the midbrain, perimesencephalic cisterns are effaced. We don't see the CSF that normally would be evident in the interpeduncular cistern, the little V-shaped area here, and the ambient cistern, which kind of lies over the quadrigeminal plate, which, which is where the superior and inferior colliculi lie, or lay. And here you have a portion of the cerebellum peaking up superiorly through the tentorial incisura, this angled portion, the tentorial incisura. I guess the important point here is to appreciate that a large hemisphere can produce intraventricular extension and mass effect. And the mass effect can produce significant compression of the brain stem like this. And that can cause death. So compression of the brain stem can cause death. And it can also cause blockage of the cerebral aqueduct. And we probably have some degree of that here. And that, together with blood going into the ventricles is a reason for steps to be taken to decompress the lateral ventricles because this will otherwise certainly result in death. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you.